Good evening, my name is Brandon Woodard and I have the privilege of being the Director of Intercultural and International Student Services, the Student Human Rights Officer and the Coordinator of Intercultural Lead here at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. And that concludes our evening. Have a good night, drive safely. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to respectfully ask you to silence your electronic devices and refrain from using them during the presentation out of respect for our presenter as well as those seated around you. I'm going to do the same thing, just double checking. We're good. Uh, also, other MLK Week events that are yet to happen. Tomorrow, we have Journey Towards Understanding from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. in the Founders Room, Quad 170, and that's a walkthrough. Then at 7 p.m., we will have Journey Towards Understanding, a community conversation. This is open to all faculty, staff, and students. It's really imperative that we show up to show our support for our community, to be engaged with our community, to lend our voices to uh, continually making our communities more inclusive. Then on Friday, we have a poetry slam and open mic at St. Ben's at 7 o'clock in O'Connell's. And then we'll close out MLK Week 2016 on Saturday in this very space. Again, at 7 p.m., we will have Showcase, immediately followed by Food for the Soul in Quad 170, or Fauna's Room again. Uh, and those events will be sponsored by lots of different folks. As a matter of fact, throughout this entire week, we've had lots of sponsors. I'll be mentioning some, as a matter of fact, right now. Uh, tonight's keynote is being sponsored by Academic Affairs the Black Student Association, the CSB Student Development Division, Cultural Affairs Board, Exploring Latin American Cultures, Intercultural and International Student Services, the Intercultural Directions Council, Learning Enhancement Service, the Mellon Grants, and SJU Student Development Division. Let's give our sponsors a round of applause. Our MLK Week 2016 keynote speaker is Dr. Eduardo Bonilla Silva. He is professor and chair of the sociology department at Duke University and gained visibility in the social sciences with his 1997 American Sociological Review article, Rethinking Racism Toward a Structural Interpretation, where he challenged social analysts to analyze racial matters from a structural perspective rather than from the sterile prejudice perspective. His research has appeared in journals such as Sociological Inquiry, Racial and Ethnic Studies, Race and Society, Journal of Latin American Studies, Research in Politics and Society, and Political Power and Social Theory, among many, many others. Two of the five books he has published are Racism Without Racists, Colorblind Racism, and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in the United States, which was a winner of the 2004 Circle Choice, or 2004 Choice Award. This book first appeared in 2003 with an expanded and revised edition in 2006, and again in 2009 with a long chapter examining the Obama phenomenon. And another book in 2011, State of White Supremacy, Racism, Governance, and the United States, with Moon Ki Jung and Zhao uh, H. Costa Vargas as co-authors. Dr. Bonilla Silva has received many awards, most notably the 2007 Louis Kozer Award given by the Theory Section of the American Sociological Association for Theoretical Agenda Setting, and in 2011, the Cox Johnson Fraser Award given by the American Sociological Association to an individual or individuals for their work in the intellectual traditions of the work of these three African American scholars. Uh, a side note, I found out while uh, interacting with Dr. Bonilla Silva uh, yesterday and today that he is also a nominee to be the president-elect of the uh, American Sociological Association, so we wish him well in that process. Following his presentation, there will be a brief question and answer section. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Bonilla Silva. Good evening. I said good evening. Good evening. OK, 
Okay, so I'm always uh, wondering why people clap before they hear the presenter, but I'll take it. Maybe after I finish, you don't want to clap. So. We are living crazy racial times. Racial matters taste sweet, and as of late, very, very, very sour. Now you know why I was eating while drafting this presentation. Yeah? Hello. On the ostensibly sweet side of things, we elected and re-elected the black man as our president. However, the sweet taste of his election quickly soured as he got attacked on racial grounds from day one by Tea Partiers and Birders. On the sour side, we have Donald Trump, or, or, or like I prefer to call him, Donaldo Trumpo, Seriously competing for the nomination for president in the Republican Party, despite his anti-Mexican, anti-Asian, and anti-Muslim positions. At the same time, on the presumably sweet side of things, Ben Carson has received significant support from the same party and people that are supporting Donald Trump. I told you, crazy racial times, yeah? On the sour side of things, we have case after case of police brutality almost every week and a rising anti-Muslim sentiment in the nation. Yet, we also have the sweet music of the Black Lives Matter movement organizing and agitating, as well as the recent mobilization of students at dozens of college campuses. So what does this all mean? And this is a question that I get asked often, particularly by media folks. Are we today more racist, less racist, or the same as 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago? To answer, to answer this question, I will do four things. First, I will try to bring some theoretical clarity on what I mean by racism and suggest that the common sense view of racism is problematic and limiting. Second, I will contend that systemic racism did not die in the 1960s with the collapse of Jim Crow, and that the new racial regime has replaced it, that I call the new racism, and I will try to describe it. Third, I will explain that although there are several racial ideologies at play in contemporary America, one rules the ideological landscape, and it's the one that I call colorblind racism, which appears in that book, Racing Without Races, that says for $29.95. <laughs> but wait, there is more. If you buy the book, too. Anyway. <laughs> Lastly, I will bring my case together and articulate what needs to be done at this crazy juncture to advance racial justice in America. This is a lot to do, so please fasten your intellectual seat belts as I will go like in the movie. Fast and furious. So let me follow the advice of the king in Alice in Wonderland and begin at the beginning. We, as people interested in racial justice, cannot continue discussing race-related events by accepting the premise that race, that thing, that we call race, is the fulcrum, is the, is the engine of things. Let me be clear and strong. Race is absolutely nothing without racism. Racism is the engine that creates the conditions for races to exist. That is, social scientists in the room and historians for racialization, which is the extension of racial meaning to peoples, tribes, migrants, or any group that becomes a so-called race. So we have races because we have racism, not the other way around. Although beginning our discussion on race matters on racism is fundamental, it is not enough. We must challenge the dominant narrative 
about racism in the white community, the media, and increasingly among some confused people of color. The racism is prejudice perspective. This perspective focuses attention on individual level analysis of subjects, attitudes, motivations, and behaviors. So for example, in terms of how folks of color are slowly but surely moving into that problematic perspective. Think about when President Obama said in 2008, and once again in the Selma speech of 2015, that racism is not endemic in America. He even said that we are like 10% to the promised land. And I'm like, wow, I missed the other 90%, yeah? Or, uh, so anyway, all were when Reverend Al Sharpton says in Morning Joe, how many of you watch TV in the morning? Only me? Okay, you, oh, you sleep? So from six to nine, there is a show on MSNBC called Morning Joe, and there is a conservative commentator called Joe Scarborough. So Al Sharpton appears, and the discussion is on police brutality, and Sharpton agrees with Scarborough that the problem of police brutality is the problem of bad apples, yeah? I'm going to contend that it's not a bad apples problem, but an apple tree problem, yeah? It's a tree that is rotten, not a few apples, okay? This racism as prejudice perspective does not allow us to justify the agenda and politics the moment requires. The more we focus on individual prejudice, the more folks will continue advocating for education, diversity training, and racial dialogues or beer summits as the solutions to racism. This is what we must find ways to advance a structural or institutional perspective of racism. We must explain that racism is about racial domination. We must explain how domination crystallized into historically specific racial regimes all over the world. So the problem of racism is not an American problem. Those of us who come from Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Brazil, even places that you think have no racial problems because you think they are racially homo homogeneous like Japan or Haiti. Race is well systemic, except that racism operates different in every society. So anyway, uh, so all these regimes have provided whites as the dominant and, and the equivalent to whites in other societies as a dominant group, systemic privilege, and non-white systemic disadvantages. And because racism provides systemic advantages for whites, they are vested in defending the racial order of things. Same as folks of color are vested in fighting racism by all means necessary. Let me now move from theory, which is like, I know that first part was dry, because theory is like medicine tastes bad, but it's good for you, yeah? So I had to begin with theory because you need first medicine. And from medicine, let's go to deeper stuff. So let me move from theory to a discussion on racial domination in post-racial times, yeah? How race works in this so-called post-racial nation of ours. I have labeled the contemporary racial regime as the new racism. I contend that the practices associated with this regime tend to be, tend to be subtle, institutional, and seemingly beyond race, yeah? For example, whereas school or residential segregation were maintained in the Jim Crow period through direct exclusionary strategies, they are reproduced today in a more sophisticated, seemingly non-racial manner. Neighborhood segregation, for example, which was accomplished in brutal fashion during the Jim Crow period, so you all have seen the movies and documentaries of minority families having a bomb planted in their neighborhood, in their house, or a burning cross. Yeah, that was the old-fashioned style. Today, residential segregation is accomplishing a more sophisticated way through strategies such as steering by realtors, realtors showing minority families, minority neighborhoods, and white families, white neighborhoods, yeah? Or 
The owners of property do not advertise the units publicly, yeah? And they just use word of mouth. Meaning, okay, I want to maintain this neighborhood white, rather than advertising publicly, I will just use word of mouth, meaning I will just tell white folks, hey, I'm selling this house, I'm renting this apartment, I don't want those people, so please send me folks like you. Redlining by banks, a practice that started in the Jim Crow era and has been recasted and rearticulated and is done in a much, much, much sophisticated way, and a number of other covert tactics. Similarly, school segregation is accomplished in sophisticated fashion. Since the courts have been that the trifling efforts of cities and states across the nation at school integration, they claim they are sufficient. Therefore, schools have resegregated. Okay, so if, if we live in neighborhoods and neighborhoods are segregated and we support neighborhood schools, what will be the result of segregated neighborhoods vis-a-vis -vis schools? Schools are segregated. And the courts have been, okay, you have done enough. And like, no, you haven't. <laughs> we're, that's why we, we're experiencing today the resegregation of schools in America. We also have multiple within school practices, such as tracking, which guarantee that even in schools that are technically integrated, you still have segregation. Yeah? My son attended a school like that in Milwaukee with a decent representation of white folks in Milwaukee. But then the white folks had, <laughs> were in the college track and had almost no connection or interaction with students of color. <coughs> and as I mentioned today in a class that I uh, uh, visited, so this new racism affects us everywhere, yeah? So when we go to stores, you know that in the past they had signs saying blacks, Jews, and other inferior peoples cannot shop in this store. Today, they cannot do that but they have ways of letting us know that we're not welcome, yeah? So now that I'm a Duke professor and have some money <laughs> and I can spend it if I wish, I realize that in certain stores, I'm not welcome, but I'm not welcome with the sign saying you are not allowed here, yeah? I'm monitored, so I can move from aisle one to aisle two, aisle three, and like, hello, where are you in aisle one and aisle two and aisle three? What are you, are you following me? No, no, I'm just checking you. Or we're ignored, happened to me in Joseph P. Banks, 20 minutes waiting for someone to work with me. They didn't. Or, as I mentioned today in the class, I'm discriminated with excessive politeness. May I help you? May I help you? May I help you? Yes. I'm trying to steal this fancy coat, and I was wondering if you give me some pointers about how to. <laughs> He didn't mean it like that. Yes, you did. That's why you are telling me that you didn't mean it like that. If you didn't mean it like that, your reaction should have been like, huh? And again, I, thankfully, I now can travel across the nation. So invariably, a white student comes to me and says, hey, in my store, we don't do that, but we do this. Yeah? Very creative strategies. Uh, one of them is in a particular store, they go and say through the PA system, a Canadian is in the store. Can you go to court and say, I experienced discrimination because when I entered the store, someone said a Canadian is in the store, or because this person asked me in uh, five minutes, three times, may I help you? No, you can't, yeah? Because that's presumably not discrimination. Discrimination is still coded based on our past system, yeah? For me to win in court, I need someone to call me the N-word, yeah? Other other forms of discrimination, the clever discrimination is not, code, is not coded or interpreted by the legal order as discrimination. In my white supremacy and racism in the post-civil rights era, I added an important, very important detail to how this new racism system works. And it's the idea that many of the practices associated with this system, system are invisible to the white population. I stated in my book, I'm getting to the age that my goal is to write a paper where I only cite myself. Yeah? <laughs> so I'm citing myself in my own talks. Yeah? So as I wrote, all domination is, in the last instance, maintained through social control strategies. And argued that the state 
the government, if you will, had become the primary enforcer of racial order. I concluded that post-civil rights practices aimed at racial control, such as police brutality, racial profiling, and surveillance of minority neighborhoods, although not, and I quote myself again, isn't that wonderful? They are not overwhelmingly covert. They are part of the new racing for a number of reasons. First, they're invisible to most whites because one, they are perpetrated by state officers. So average white folks do not participate on a daily basis on the enforcement of racial control. Two, the agencies in charge are deemed racially neutral, yeah? Third, the white public perceives crime as black and brown, thus legitimizing the police actions and abuse, yeah? So, well, they are trying to keep them in control, so and because they are criminals, so it's okay, yeah? And lastly, the incidents that happen and garner public attention, for those of you of a certain age in the room, from the Rodney King case, it seems that it was 300 years ago, yeah? to Amadou Diallo, also the young people don't know those names, but you know Trayvon Martin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? So those incidents used to be treated as isolated incidents. I add to this list the obvious. The bulk of this brutality and monitoring happens in segregated neighborhoods. Thus, these things were not visible to most of us until cell phones and social media. So what has changed in the last few years is something happens, and in a matter of hours, the world, literally, the world knows, yeah? So let me expound a bit on hegemonic racial domination in post-racial times. Perhaps since the murder of Trayvon Martin, we have focused our attention mostly on police brutality. Can I get some water? Yeah, yeah. This is expected. A social mobilization always follows incidents that galvanize the attention, people's attention, and we have had plenty of opportunities. Trayvon, Big Mike, Eric Garner, Scott Wallace, Freddie Gray, Yvette Smith, Sandra Bland, and many, 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 many more. Watching the news or checking your Facebook page gives the impression that we are indeed in what Michelle Alexander labels as the New Jim Crow. Some of you have read her book, Michelle Alexander. Okay. Okay. But I want to suggest that this interpretation is, and I like her and some of her ideas, but I think ultimately she is wrong. And I'll try to explain why. So she's wrong because her position limits our ability to understand what is going on and what needs we need to do to move forward. Let me try to explain my, my concern with her view, which I think is now, many of us are into this, the enemy is police brutality, okay? First, although it seems like police brutality and police shootings of black and brown folks are on the rise, data from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, on cause of death data reveals that between 1968 and 2011, Blacks were in average 4.2 times more likely to be killed by cops than whites. So police brutality is not a new thing. Talk to poor folks, poor black and brown folks, and tell them, well, this police brutality is a new thing, and tell you, say what? You need to come down to our neighborhoods. This is daily, and it has been daily life for us for, ye for decades, yeah? For, for 40 years, yeah? Police brutality and shootings of black and brown folks have been a consistent fact of life for people of color in post-racial new racism in America. The contemporary moment for those of a certain age here is reminiscent to the 1980s, the Reagan years, where Klan and neo-Nazis grew and racial violence by regular white folks against people of color intensified. So today we have Donald Trump in the 1980s, we have Ronald Reagan. We call Ronald Reagan a fascist. He was not. And we call Donald Trump a fascist. He's not. I don't mean that he's not dangerous. Perhaps he's more dangerous than a fascist, yeah? 
because the fascists, we immediately, okay, we need to fight this person. But we find him amusing and like, oh, like we used to say about Reagan. Reagan, all the folks in the room remember? We used to say, Reagan is an idiot, this guy, not too smart, he's an actor, he cannot, and he won. He, won. he gave us eight years of hell. And I'm not sure, but I'm thinking that this Donald Trump may, may win if we don't begin fighting and organizing and making demands, yeah? Um, anyway. Second, the vilification of blacks and brown folks, which allows most whites to be okay with the violence inflicted upon us by police officers, began way back, but intensified in the 1960s. This vilification has crystallized in controlling images, and there are two that are central. One is the notion of the criminal black man, increasingly the criminal black and brown man. Yeah? You see a black person, you see a criminal, yeah? Doesn't matter if you are dressed with a suit, yeah? And secondly, the image of the criminalization of urban space, yeah? If you live in urban America, you're dangerous, yeah? Both of these images have facilitated measures, laws, and policing tactics that have produced our mass incarceration system. Finally, and this is key, the majority of racial practices and behaviors that keep us in our new place, including those performed by state officers, are of the new racism or hegemonic variety. Although our organizational focus on violence is understandable, so I know why you get organized to fight against police brutality. And by the way, I'm not saying not, <laughs> not to fight or ignore police brutality. I'm saying that our task is larger than that. So I think we need to be analytical and political about how racial inequality is reproduced in post-racial America. We are not, as I suggested, in a new Jim Crow era, as racial domination in schools, jobs, stores, or in the streets is mostly, but certainly not exclusively, accomplished in a now you see it, now you don't fashion. When you're asked, may I help you, at Northstone, or decline a, for a job or denied admission to college based on an exam that measures gap, yeah? Or charge more for a loan independent of your financial profile, or steered into a different neighborhood, neighborhood by a smiling realtor, hello. <laughs> I, that was funny, whatever. <laughs> or told by white colleagues that all your accomplishments are due to affirmative action, I, as I have been told several times. All you are dealing with are examples of what I call the new racism. And although these things, you know, it ain't politically sexy to organize against these things, they are the gods of the racial monster we face these days. So we're going to fight monsters first, recognize monsterhood, yeah? What is the specifics of this monster? Should we use garlic, steaks, silver bullets? So be specific on the monster you're trying to kill. A good illustration of how concentrating our attention on overt matters puts us in a bind is our focus on police brutality. The city of Cleveland, after an investigation by Obama's Department of Justice, that showed brutal patterns of racialized policing, recommended a number of things, such as a civilian police inspector general, a community board overseeing the department, and new rules on use of force. And you know what the city of Cleveland did? They agreed with the Department of Justice, and are in a process of trying to change their basic policing strategies. The issue, is the following. Although all these things I mentioned are good and dandy, limiting our policy to sanitizing how we are police misses the boat. As good policing will not change the conditions 
that have, am I behind? So good policing will not change the conditions that have ghettoized the black and brown masses in America. We need jobs, good jobs. We need programs to increase our wealth. We need equal education. We need affirmative action and perhaps even reparations. And above all, we need an end to the new systemic racism that keep us in this secondary position in the country, as well as an end to the old-fashioned stuff that still happens here and there. Having a professional non-racist police force is very important, so don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, hey, don't do anything there. But having this professional police non-racist force will do absolutely nothing to change our over overall situation in racist America. This is a cartoon for you to read while I drink my water. Break. Let me talk, now talk briefly about the contemporary racial ideological field in our nation. In my book, Racism Without Races, I argue that the new racial ideology dominates the landscape. And I call it, those of you who have read it, colorblind racism. I will describe this ideology, but want to begin by stating that that's the book, 2995. I have to leave it, my, my publisher told me, leave it, because we have done research. If you leave it more than three seconds, it impacts people more, anyway. It's, they do it. It's marketing people. Are, you know, they, they know their stuff. They, they know their stuff. Okay. So, although there is a dominant ideology, I'm going to suggest that at no historical moment you have only one ideology at play. There, is, there are always competing arguments, yeah? Whether we're talking about race ideology, gender ideology, class ideology, yeah? So this means that although colorblind racism is dominant, we still have strong pockets of old-fashioned prejudice out there. How many whites spout the old-fashioned racist stuff? Hard to tell with precision, but based on survey data and some political outcomes data, I surmise that between 10 to 15 percent of whites are still in this old-fashioned camp. That's a lot of people, yeah? But it still means that 85 to 90 percent of whites are not in that game, yeah? But I want to also suggest that not all the folks spewing old-fashioned racial poison do so in the same way as whites did in yesteryears, yeah? So when the ideological landscape changes, even old-fashioned people have to change, yeah? Variations in tonality and articulations with elements of color blindness abound. For instance, Although Donald Trump has made racially crude remarks, he has also insisted, one, I'm not a racist, I love Mexicans. I love, have you heard it, you know? I love Mexicans, they love me, I hear them all the time. Love Muslims, some of my best friends are Muslims. And then he claims that Mexicans love him back. Actually, that person, that woman, you remember that rally where this woman said, I love you, Donald Trump. He's just Colombian, but in the collective white imagination, we see a Latino and we assume Mexican. Yeah? More significantly, Trump's racist articulation has not been coded by the media in general and by most journalists as really racist. If he had been, he would not be on the media every freaking day. Think about that. If we really believe he's a racist, why are we like giving him free time all the time? And it is because most journalists and media folks don't really think he's a racist, yeah? So he gets a pass. And he improves ratings, so Saturday Night Live can be like, I'm cool with having Donald Trump. He's fun, yeah? If he were a Klan member, 
What do you think would happen to the Klan member? Imagine a person, I'm a member of the Klan, but I'm not a racist. Yeah? Do you think that person would get <laughs> sort of a, all the time that Donald Trump is getting in the, on TV? I don't think so. We have data, yeah? Remember Donald Sterling, the former owner of the, mm -hmm. as soon as he made his comments, out, out of the game, literally. And what happened to that rancher, Clive Bundy, who was, you know, heralded for a week by many conservative Republicans, until he made that comment about, no, slavery was educational for black people because it taught them the value of work. <laughs> okay, we need to distance, and he disappeared, yeah? Donald Trump is still out there. Now I can state the basics of what I call colorblind racism, which I think is the dominant way that we transact race matters in contemporary America. So my claim in my book is that the nasty racial discourse of the past has been, for the most part, replaced by a more civilized prejudice, the one I call colorblind racism, by which I mean the new dominant racial ideology anchored on the abstract extension of the principles of liberalism to raise matters, to explain these matters in non-racial fashion. This ideology is comprised of frames, style, and racial stories. And because time is running out, and I want to talk about what is to be done, I will give you one example of frames, of style, and of racial stories. If you want more, And you know what's coming, <laughs> okay. The central frames of this ideology are abstract liberalism, cultural racism, naturalization, and minimization of racism. So let me address abstract liberalism, which is, I think is the core of this ideology. So abstract liberalism frames race-related issues using the language of liberalism but in an abstract and decontextualized manner, which allows whites to say all kinds of stuff without then following through with policies and practices that would allow us to move to, the, to get to the promised land. So let me give you one example, and the example is Jim, a 30-year-old computer software salesperson from a privileged background who explained his opposition to affirmative action in the following way. I think it's unfair top to bottom, and everybody and the whole process, it often, you know, discrimination itself is a bad word, right? But you discriminate every day. You want to buy a beer at the store, and there are six kinds of beers you can get from Natural Light to Sam Adams, right? And you look at the price, and you look at the kind of beer, and you, it's a choice. And a lot of that you have laid out in front of you. Which one do you get? Now, should the government sponsor Sam Adams and make it cheaper than Natural Light because it's brewed by someone in Boston? That doesn't make much sense, right? Why would we want that or make some atoms eight times as expensive because we want people to buy natural light? Got it? Probably not. And I use this quote again and again and again precisely because that is the sort of plausible deniability of the way we talk about race. This doesn't look, quote unquote, racist. But I'm going to try to deconstruct this so you see the, uh, what is the problem with the way that this uh, person is explaining his opposition to affirmative action, okay? So Jim assumes that hiring decisions in America are like market choices, yeah? Competing brands of beer. Therefore, he has a laser fair view on hiring. Hire the one you like the most or the one that is quote unquote most qualified, yeah? The problem with Jim's view, a view shared by most whites, is that Labor market di in discrimination is alive and well and affects black and Latino job applicants anywhere between 30 to 50% of the time. Think about that. The best estimates we have, 30 to 50% of the time. Now we have experimental work by Diva Pager, uh, formerly at Princeton, now at Harvard. And what she did was she fabricated a resume. Same qualifications, it's the same resume. She just decided to change the name. And names can be racialized, yeah? If your name is Tyrone, you most likely are? 
Okay, thank you. Give me a white name. Stuart. <laughs> Ken, 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 Kenneth, yeah? So she decided to have Tyrone and Kenneth. And you know what happened? Same resume, same qualifications. No one can say, well, Ken is really more, it's the same resume. Ken got more callbacks than Tyrone. And she decided, let me go a deep further. Let me have the same resume, but add that Ken had a criminal record. The expectation is what? Now who should have the advantage? Tyrone. Tyrone. Guess what is the finding? Still, slight advantage for Ken. Think about the impact of race, that you are more willing to hire a person with, and by the way, I think that we need to, in that Obama has done right, yeah? I think that we need to rethink the criminal justice, the, the criminal injustice system, yeah? And our penal system, perhaps even think about abolishing it and doing it anew. But you know that that's not going to happen tomorrow. And we know that in the streets of America, if someone has a criminal record, you're going to be one. You're going to experience discrimination. Well, in this case, you're more likely to hire a white person with a criminal background than the, than the person with the same qualifications without a criminal background but with the penalty of being black. Okay. The second problem with Jim's position on hiring folks out there is that he believes that most jobs in America are given in meritocratic fashion. That is, the most qualified gets the job. We had George Bush as our president for eight years. That should have been enough evidence that we don't live in a meritocratic nation. But apparently we need more data. So the data shows that between 80 to 85% of the jobs out there are secured through informal networks. The hookup, young people, I don't, I don't mean that hookup. <laughs> I'm talking about networks, connections, yeah? So yes, get your degree, work hard, study hard, and if the person sitting by you, the last name is Rockefeller, you're like, hello, Rocky, yeah? Because networks, connections matter, yeah? So therefore, by holding a strict laser fair view on hiring, while ignoring the significant impact of discrimination in the labor market, Jim can safely voice his opposition to affirmative action in an apparently race-neutral way. That is colorblind racism. That's the way we talk and transact race matters out there. So let me say a few things about the style of colorblind racism. That is, about the verbal strategies we use to manufacture racial statements at a time where the norms of what can be said in public have changed. Yeah? That is an important change. Yeah? 50 years ago, people would use the N-word like, you know, like nothing. We still use it, but we have to be more strategic of when to deploy it. Yeah? So we know that in public conversations, we may not use that language. You still want to talk about race, you have to then develop a statistic tools so that you can communicate your racial viewpoints without risking to be called racist. So in the book, I uncover five major stylistic components of this ideology, namely semantic moves, projection, diminutives, and just a little tiny bit against affirmative action. I'm 100% against affirmative action, just by a little bit. Yeah? Avoidance of racist talk and rhetorical incoherence, yeah? Again, for time's sake, I will give you only one example of one semantic move. What are these semantic moves? These are verbal strategies that we use to be able to talk about race and look good and have always the plausible deniability, yeah? Some of them are old-fashioned stuff that we all recognize and they have become, they're still out there, but less effective, yeah? Ideologies are always in the making. They're never finished, yeah? So let me give you two that all of you have heard, and we in college, we in universities recognize them because they are so trifled that we are like, if I say, I'm not a racist bot, <laughs> after the bot, you go crazy, yeah? But you, you like, like Donald Trump, I'm not a racist, some of my best friends are black. I don't know their names, but I'm not, they are some of my best friends. What's their name, what's their name? I know, you know, that black guy, you know? Okay. So therefore, ideologies are constantly in the making new information, new ideas, so they need to return. And I found out a move, so if I were doing the project today, 
I would find a semantic move like, I voted for Obama, but. <laughs> oh, thank you, you voted for Obama, that you are exempted, yeah? <laughs> Sorry, you can say whatever you want about us. You're good, you're cool, yeah? Uh, actually, no. But anyway, so that would be an example of how ideologies are always in the making and on the move, yeah? So one that I found was this semantic move that I call the yes and no move. And it's a move that allows people to say, I'm, I'm conflicted, yeah? I'm yes and no, but I'm not sure. So let me give you an example of a person. Sandra, who is a retail-sized person in her 40s, answered the question, are you for or against affirmative action? And by the way, we can have it, I want to separate your position on affirmative action from the arguments, on the ideological arguments used to explain your position. These are two different things, related but different, yeah? So she answered in the apparently cryptic manner. Yes and no. I feel someone should be able to have something, education, job, whatever, because they have earned it, they deserve it. They have the ability to do it. You don't want to put a six-year-old as a rocket scientist. They don't have the ability. Doesn't matter if the kid's black or white. Do you see the yes part of her answer? Hello, it's a strong no. But if she were in a discursive battle with someone, and someone says, hey, I heard you, you don't have, you really are against the, I told you I'm conflicted, yes and no, yeah? The last component of colorblind racism is racial stories. There are two types of racial stories. Storylines and testimonies. And I will provide today one example of a testimony. So these testimonies allow whites to vent intense animosity yeah, about race matters. And the animosity can be positive or negative. Yeah? So you can say, you know, in World War II, my best buddy Tyrone, he and I were in the foxhole. I love Tyrone, and I haven't talked to him in 50 years, but we, we were really close. So you use this testimony to ex sort of forgive yourself for the five, 50 years of not having connection to black people because you, back in the day in World War II, had a black body, yeah? Or you can be like Bill, who is a retired school teacher in his, when we interviewed him in his early 80s, so I'm giving you people who are young, middle-aged, and now older respondents, who is a retired school teacher who narrated this testimony to explain why he thinks that black and white people are different. So he pointed out that blacks seem to be, and I quote him, very religious people, and that they bought a church in his neighborhood. Then he claimed that they forced a restaurant out of business. And he explained this in the following way. They like to eat. They pile their dishes just loaded with that stuff. And I actually didn't see it, but I saw one lady, again, it's 80, so. I actually didn't see it, but I saw one lady come in with a full plate of chicken. I didn't pay much attention. But the next thing I know, they are leaving. Now, I know she didn't eat all that chicken. She probably put it in her purse and walked out with it. A lot of them are doing that. How can they make any money? And seeing that they're all heavy people, it seems like they do a lot of eating. So I don't know what to say about something like that. OK, here you have an example of a person who really is an old-fashioned Donald Trump type of person, but he's trying to work with the new colorblind stuff and fumbling, yeah? Because people who grew up 50, 60 years in one particular way of navigating life, all of a sudden, a new game in town, they will not be experts on the language and efficacy of using colorblind stuff, yeah? But the point remains that he used this story to validate his belief that black folks like to eat, are cheap, and steal. So now I can answer the question I posed at the outset. Remember my question? Are we more, less, or the same in terms of racism as we were 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago? So let me suggest first. To the question, is racism more pronounced today than a decade ago? The answer is 
that the issue is not if we have more or less racism today, but whether systemic racism is still in place. Yeah? To this more targeted question, my answer is that we have a new racial regime in town that I call the new racism, characterized by seemingly non-racial practices. The system is solidified, and we do not have the politics or language to fight it. Second, our political challenge to racism, systemic and ideological, should no longer be organized around fighting Jim Crow racism. When we focus attention on the racist, the racist cops, the racist teachers, or the racist anything, we miss fighting the racism, the systemic way in which racial inequality is reproduced. But please do not misunderstand my point. I am not suggesting not doing anything about the racial climate and violence we're witnessing. Right? I'm not saying that you have a big incident in campus, you should not do anything about it. You should. But for every macro big incident that happens, for every so-called isolated incident that happens in this college, every day race matters in the lives of faculty, staff, and students of color. And it matters in a multiplicity of ways. We, so I'm telling you that you must defend, you know, we must defend ourselves by any means necessary. But we must fight the smiling new racing monster as he is the one responsible for our collective position in the economy, in politics, and in society. Third, social scientists and common folks keep thinking that prejudice is about saying nasty things about people of color. Although we have, as I stated, pockets of old-fashioned prejudice among whites, the normative way of de defending the racial order of, order of things is colorblind racism. And in colleges, I think many of you will say, yep. Every, maybe once I heard someone using the language of the past, but most of the time, the experiences that students of color have is with this kind of colorblind nonsense, yeah? So therefore, we need the normative way of defending the racial order is colorblind racism. To be clear, we must chastise all fools saying racist stuff, but we must understand that most whites keep us down these days with a civilized, with this civilized colorblind stuff. Colorblind racism is like that song of Roberta Flag, "Killing me softly." By the way, I sang. That's extra. Okay? <laughs> but if you kill me softly, I'm still dead. Yeah. Now I can address what is to be done to fight racism without races, to fight a seemingly beyond race, the seemingly beyond racism we face today. First, we must understand and teach to anyone who will listen about the true nature of racism. We must preach that racism is not about good and bad people. but about an institutional racial order that benefits some at the detriment of others. Second, we must talk about racism as a structural problem of America. Therefore, the job at hand is undoing the multiple practices, mechanisms, institutions, and behaviors that produce and reproduce race inequality. This means we must be critical of those who believe that diversity trainings, teaching tolerance, or having beer summits will take us to the promised land. Although being nice and drinking a beer, it's good, feels good, yeah? These things will not change the basics of our racial order. For that to happen, we need a serious social transformation. Third, traditional organizations such as the NAACP and others are still anchored on a civil rights, Jim Crow-based agenda. This limits their effectiveness as they are ill-equipped to handle the contemporary way in which race matters. So let me end by outlining a specific plan of action for you who are located in a university setting. First, you must appreciate 
the centrality of social movements in fighting racism. You must understand the social structural nature of racism and therefore recognize the urgent need to get somewhat away from electoral politics and more into organizing people for social change. I'm not saying that you should not vote and participate in elections. I'm saying that social movements historically have been more important for us to advance our collective interests. Second, you live in communities and must work in them too. Your, your job on race, racial justice should not end here in colleges and universities as you can influence people in your neighborhoods, churches, synagogues, and social clubs. The struggle for racial justice demands that you care about race 24-7. Actually, 24-7 is a bit too much. But you know what I mean, <laughs> seriously, yeah? Third, as people in colleges, you have a very real task at hand. You have to work hard to transform these places that I call HWCUs, historically white colleges and universities, into truly multicultural institutions. This is a huge task. But you must begin by pointing out the obvious. Our colleges claim diversity, yet the plain fact is that they are white-led and white-oriented institutions of higher learning. <laughs> I heard that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, we must educate people, but we must educate ourselves too. For white students, faculty and staff, this means moving beyond liberalism, beyond telling me I'm a good person, to becoming an anti-racist. And anti-racism begins by retooling oneself, by working to reframe and reimagine how you live your life. With whom do you associate? And what do you do about systemic, cultural, and personal racism? In the crazy racial times we live, white men and women of good faith should join their minority brothers and sisters in the new struggle for racial justice as black, brown, native, and Asian lives matter. The time for theoretical progressiveness is over. It is time for all of us to recommit to the struggle. It is time for action. In the words of black abolitionists, Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without the demand. It never did, and it never will. Thank you. OK, let's do it. Let's talk. Thank you, thank you. Let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. Don't do that. Okay, comments, questions, engagements, criticisms. I'm, I'm here for another uh, 40 minutes, I think. Yes. Um, first and foremost, Dr. Bonilla Silva, you are my medicine man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Because I use a lot of your work. I'm a professor at Central State in my class. Oh, great. And I'm constantly interrogating white supremacy and trying to deal with the wonderful sisters and brothers, young people that exist in this room trying to engage them in addressing this sophisticated form of racism that you have beautifully and eloquently talked about. And I'm grateful for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to talk to you. It's funny how you talk about it, because this is a beautiful community. They invited you here, and I'm grateful that you came here. Uh, the liberal racism you're talking about, and the sense of false equalization of things. Let me give you one quick example. For example, this lovely institution that we are residing in tonight does not acknowledge the Martin Luther King Day as a holiday. That's a contradiction. That's a serious contradiction. Because, it, and the, the answer to the question of why they don't do that is this. They say, well, we don't acknowledge President's Day either. We don't acknowledge other holidays. What they've done is they have dehistoricized the existential reality of why that holiday should be celebrated. They decontextualized it and removed it. I would want your wisdom, sir. Am I a crazy <laughs> black man? OK, you're, you're my host, but uh, it's, it's a check on the man. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I'm going to speak through to power. I think that this college needs to change that relation. And you have two options. 
Either you observe the holiday, as most people do, which, by the way, you and I know, as good as that is, symbolically, is becoming a place, I, I work at Duke University, we celebrate the holiday, which means people go on vacation. I don't like the vacation style. So either we, I prefer something like what you did this year, but it has to be institutionally organized. And rather than holding classes, you hold a whole day of engagement on race discussions. That, that is a very tradition. And it has to be, it has to be institutionally sponsored. I think it has to be not optional. So you, this is, we do this, and you spouse Benedictine values, live your life. Leave your values. Leave your commitment. You care about community? Dr. King care, care about the beloved community. We, ha we are not there yet, but we will not get to the beloved community until we begin changing people's minds and hearts. And we have to begin somewhere. And this is a small step. One day, one freaking day, for us to do something. And that day is not just about Martin Luther King and our legacy of raising America is about the future. And that's why that is a day that I think students and faculty of color need to be heard loud and clear. And I'm always surprised that many of my white colleagues, they never talk to me. And they don't know about that. So they, are, they assume that we are all happy. So when we explode, when we check them, they're like, I don't know why you're so angry. I'm like, oh, so you don't know? You have no idea? Let's talk. Because you never talk to me. I, have, I mentioned this today. I had one person who was mad because of something, and the person told me, you offended me as, as I mean, we are friends, and you offended me. I'm like, wait, wait, wait a second. First of all, I really intend to offend you. If I offended you, I apologize for that. But I want to clarify something. We are not friends. I said, oh, you deny that we're friends? I'm like, no, let's define friends. We're acquaintances. We're colleagues. Friends, let's define friendship. I've never been to your house, never been to your birthday. I don't know anything about your family. I don't know about your pain. I don't know about anything about you. And you don't know anything about me. So don't elevate me to friendship to feel good about yourself. Okay? Honesty is central to this conversation on race that we should have. And we have to begin <laughs> with honesty. Don't call me friend and don't be like, oh, like, you know. I'm, a, I'm offended as your friend. Friend? Come on. So, anyway, so I thank you for your question. Thank you. Hello. Yes. I'm just curious. Um, what sparked your passion for studying racism? Long story. I'll give you the short version. <laughs> so when I was your age, so I, lived, I grew up, I was born in the U.S. 53 years ago. Can you detect my Western Pennsylvania accent? <laughs> but I grew up in Puerto Rico, a country that claims to be, you know where I learned colorblind stuff? Not in the US, but in Puerto Rico. And high ground in Mexico, Cuba, or Brazil, same sort of. We don't have race here. The US, America has given the best gift to humanity. Everybody can claim racism. <laughs> that is in the US, we don't have it here. So whatever country in the world is, they say, no, that's in the US. But we have racism across the world, yeah? Racism seems plural, yeah? There is no one variety. There are tonalities of the same phenomenon, yeah? So I grew up in a country where race mattered all my life. I've been, I'm, I'm writing a post on this for Facebook. I have been feeling race since I was a young kid. But I didn't have the space and the names to call it race, yeah? I had to call it something else. I knew that it was because I was a dark kid that I got treated differently, even within my own family. Yeah? But I had no space to talk, to talk about that. So then I did what many young progressive folks do in my country. I became a young radical student, a young communist, okay? Socialist. And class was everything. So whenever anyone, I remember the first time I went to a forum on racing in Puerto Rico. And there was a woman, I remember her name, Doris Pizarro talking about racism. I was mad. I, a dark person who knew that race mattered, because I was a socialist, I could not accept that race mattered. So I'm mad in the, think about this, the contradiction. I'm a dark young man who knew that race mattered in my life, who had gotten race incidents, which I coded as 
prejudice. Not that's racism, but that prejudice individuals did this to me and my father, yeah? So I was mad with her. And then I came to the US when I was 21. I came back again to my country of birth. And then all of a sudden, the re I remember for two years, I'm still like a Marxista Cuadrado, a square Marxist. There is no race, it's every and there is no gender, by the way. Everything is, you tell me about racism? Racism is an ideology developed by the, put the violin. Race, repeat after me. Racism is an ideology developed by the bourgeoisie to divide workers. What about sexism? Sexism is an ideology <laughs> developed by the bourgeoisie to divide workers. What about homophobia? Homophobia is, I don't even know what it is that, but you know, it must be something that the capitalist class did, you know. And slowly, thankfully, one grows and re begins rethinking stuff. And all the pain that I experienced as a young, dark boy in Puerto Rico, as a young man, and now in retrospect, I can go incident after incident, yeah? And if I tell you, you don't know the country, you think that these experiences happened to me in the US. Okay? Like, my school counselor, I scored very well in the freaking exam, mission exam to college, and she asked me, do you like sports? I'm 17, I'm like, sure. I think you should uh, consider a career in physical education. I'm like, eh, my parents are college professors, I don't, think they would, you are the son of Ruth Silva de Bonilla. Oh my goodness, she was my college teacher. Oh, they forget it, you know, let's talk about your real college options, you know. Anyway, so all the pain that I got through as a kid, I started connecting the dots and thinking, wow, so Puerto Rico has a racist formation. Actually, Puerto Rico is today what you will be in 40 years, yeah? Because the racial history of Puerto Rico, or Mexico, or Cuba, or Brazil is 100 years older than yours. So what you're getting now, the beginnings of this colorblind, new racism stuff, is what we have had in Latin America and the Caribbean for 80, 90 years, okay? So the passion came from that realization that race matters everywhere. And that I, when you are getting the smack, Either you, you know, die or you fight back. So I chose to fight back, and I've been fighting back since I sort of gained consciousness of race as central to my life, to the life of my country, my people, both Puerto Ricans and black Puerto Ricans in the US and elsewhere. And I they develop also solidarity with folks of color across the world. Yes. So it's a concept that is nonsense, and I'm going to tell you why. If racism is what I define, a system that provides systematic advantages to whites over non-whites, easily you can dismiss that notion because if there is reverse racism, then you should check the data on good jobs, on the good things in life, yeah? What is the proportion of black Puerto Rican doctors, architects, lawyers, college professors. The data is available. Check the Census Bureau. Very, we're underrepresented on all those good things in life. We're overrepresented. You know where there is reverse? <laughs> it's not reverse racism. You see, you want to know where we're overrepresented? In the bullshit jobs. Can I say bullshit in this country? Well, I can say it, okay. <laughs> in the jobs that nobody wants because they're dangerous, they pay nothing, you know. So no one is talking about, hey, you took my jobs in McDonald's, you know? I want my spot in McDonald's, yeah? No one is fighting for those jobs, yeah? We're fighting for the good stuff. College admissions, when they say, well, <laughs> it looks like, you know, it looks like you guys, you, you guys get admitted to Harvard for like nothing. I'm like, oh, really? How many black faculty Harvard has? Have you looked at the data? How many black professors <laughs> do you have in this college, yeah? Um, so we are underrepresented on the good thing. So the reverse racism ideology is part of this contemporary discussion, yeah? But it's formidable because formally it looks okay, yeah? You can say, I'm all for equal opportunity. That is why I oppose affirmative action. 
because affirmative action is discrimination in reverse. So on the philosophical standpoint, it looks like a perfectly rational argument, except that it misses the fact that we still have discrimination. Secondly, it misses the fact that we're still underrepresented. So when you talk about reverse discrimination, it's like, show me the data. I'm a social scientist, emphasis on both social and scientists. So I want to check the data, yeah? And the data doesn't suggest that we have that. Now, if you are asking me theoretically, historically, is it possible that down the road, a society can have a system in which people of color can be at the top and white people at the bottom? And like theoretically, yes. It has not happened. We don't have records of that, yeah? Even places that you think, what about South Africa? Say, well, let's talk about South Africa. Let's talk about South Africa. Yeah, the black elite after Mandela got free, it got something, but the black masses are, look at the data, they are really, really bad, okay? Tell me the country, yeah? Now, theoretically, on that, I'm, so racism is a system, and I'm willing to contemplate possibilities, yeah? But I think that the historical record suggests that that will not happen because the global struggle against white supremacy will not produce then systems based on race trying to put the other group down. That probably is not in the historical counts. Okay, questions in the back, comments? Hello? Wow, this is easy. <laughs> no questions, no comments? Yes? <laughs> Give me your money. <laughs> I think that Donald Trump is beyond salvation because part of being a member, I mean, honestly, this is not about Donald Trump. I'm going to suggest that most rich people believe that they are in the position they are because they are smart and work hard. Now, of course, you all probably have read the biography of Mr. Donald Trump, who keeps telling how smart and brilliant he is. Usually when people are bragging about how smart they are, they're not too smart, yeah? Um, so you know that he, his daddy gave him a lot of money, yeah? So when he says, I'm self-made, I'm like, please, man. We, the problem is that you have your record out there. Your daddy gave you all kinds of money. And yes, the only thing I can tell you is, you are a good scam artist, yeah? You can declare bankruptcy, and most of us declare bankruptcy, and that's it for us. But for him, it's like, you know, whiteness is something, yeah? Okay, I declare bankruptcy, but I'm going to come back. And bankers, give me money. Why? Because I'm good. The polls, you know, have you seen how he does it? It's amazing. This, I mean, I don't know what's happening to us as a country. Eh? This is a Donald Trump speech. Do you see the polls? You see the polls? I'm doing great. I'm huge. I'm huge. I'm great. Very smart. Okay, get that person out. Hey, media. Political correctly. And then we call that a speech. So yes, he doesn't use teleprompter. I'll give you that. That is impressive. I do this for a living, so I do care when someone is able to talk off the cuff for like an hour. But he's talking nonsense. This is stream of consciousness, and we are such a bored people. Perhaps we as Americans are becoming a bored people. So any idiot comes and tells us something that makes us laugh, and sort of connects a little bit with our anger, and we're like, yeah! And you're like, so what is the policy proposal you support? Make America great again. I'm like, okay, but what specific policy? You know. I'm like, no, I don't. Can you tell me what are the policy that Donald Trump, uh, you know, he's strong and he's rich and Sarah Palin supports him, so, and he's huge and that's it. Anyway, so that's all I would have to tell Donald Trump. <laughs> that, by the way, that came. I came from somewhere. I, had, I, I usually sort of can predict 85% uh, of the questions. That one, I never got it yet. But now I have an answer. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You helped me for the next presentation. I have a talk in New York Friday. Maybe someone asked, what would you tell Donald Trump? I'm like, give me your money. <laughs> <laughs> On this side, one question. At least one more, and then we go and drink. Well, I know this housing you drinking, but you know, those of us who Yes, you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.
Baseball is having a tough time because when you want to study racing for real, there is no money. The ends, all the funding agencies will not do give you money to study race for real. They give you money to do work on race and genetics. So the, the biological reasons of race are coming back. There is money for that. There is money for implicit bias research, which is true. It's true that we have this deep unconscious on race. 500 years of race domination have produced a more sort of a collective unconscious of race. Yeah? And we are all part of that collective unconscious. Even people of color can be sort of you know, unconsciously biased against black people. And that is important, but I don't think that is how race domination happens. I don't think implicit bias is the central key component in explaining racial domination nowadays. Yeah? So when you say, I want to study race and housing markets, race and wealth, race and, they tell you, can you do a survey? And like, well, the problem is that the surveys are usually based on older questions that are increasingly less relevant. Yeah? They have become a multiple choice. A multiple choice, you answer the question that is correct even if you don't agree with the answer. Yeah? If a black family with about your same income moves in your neighborhood, do you mind it a little, a lot, or not at all? Correct answer, not at all. Except that we know when a neighborhood becomes about 7% minority, people vote with their feet, and we have a name for that called white flag. Yeah? So that means that we're going to have to be creative to do the research and the policy that needs to be carried out. So if you're a college professor, ask your students to work with you on projects. So you may not get the NSF, you may not get the Ford Foundation, you may not get the NIH to give you the money to do the work you want to do. So you know what, ultimately, although research is important, Research and more data will not save us, yeah? So you do it because you want to document things, but we're going to have to be creative. Nothing new under the sun. It's not that back in the day people were giving, like when I did my book, I didn't get much money. I hustled, yeah? It's part of the people of color way of living, yeah? You have to hustle and hustle and hustle and find ways, okay, I get 10,000 here, 5,000 there, I give a talk, I give taxi up to what and this and that, and, you know. It's a car game, yeah? So, thank you for your question. Okay, one more, and then maybe. Yes. Oh, good. In the front, yeah. You're talking about how that is against institutional racism. How does a student of color combat against racism in the way they have experienced it, but someone like a professor? Those are the questions that are hard. Is a professor? <laughs> All of you heard the question. So you have an experience with discrimination and you tell the story to a professor and the professor is like, I don't think the person intended it that way. Maybe they intended when they called you that name, they meant it in a good way. You know? Well, uh, Dismissing our, this is part of the contemporary drama race. Yeah? Whenever we talk about race, they're like, you guys are hypersensitive. Not, not everything is about race, you know. And I'm like, not everything, but a lot is about race. Okay? And so you, part of the deal is that I think that for good political reasons, you have to expect that the first person for you to talk about this should be people in, within your own communities of color who will validate you. So if I depend, then, let me give you an example. I went through a, academic racism is real, okay? And we faculty of color get it, I mean, students of color, you don't know our, I know your pain, you don't know mine, yeah? I know your pain because I hear it, but you don't know our pain. And it is real, and it is deep, and it's hard to talk. In part because we have so few of us in the academy, yeah? And most of us are deep and black Puerto Rican, and as I say jokingly, if I were gay, my university would say, yeah, we got it, man. Black, Latino, 
gay, differently able, you are captain diversity. We don't need to do that. You'll be in the committee on disabled stuff. You're going to be in the committee of gay and lesbians, Latinos, black, etc. So part of the problem we have is that we're so few. So when things happen to us, like in my case, I had a, a tenure button here, and people were just giving me lies, my comments. Well, you know, he said, maybe, you know, you're not that good. Blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, so I was like, you know, devastated for a little bit. And then I did what you should have done. I went and talked to a colleague of color in another department. I have to go to another department because my department, I was the only person of color. So I went and talked to this other colleague in political science who told me, oh, you are the third person that goes to this game. This is what they do. And she gave me the ABCD. And that was mentally, spiritually, like, oh, wow. So it's real, yeah? Your experience is real. Mine was real, too, except that my own colleagues, the people who want to be my friends but are not really my friends, are lying to me, telling me some BS. So I got the data. Oh, data will free me. So I went and wrote a long letter to my provost. Not threatening legal action, but sort of hinting at the Mamadi and raise no food. So we have a contract, and I don't want to enforce it, but if you don't, then, you know, Johnny Cochran is coming back. And he's mad as hell, and so am I. So I got my reparations, I got my tenure thing settled. Uh, my chair was unhappy because I battled on my own, and then he was like, you know, hey, you know, I heard that you got some big money. I'm like, you bet that I got some big money, but you know what? For six months, I was like that movie, Dead Man Walking. Walking in my department like I'm a second class person. And no more. How come you didn't ask me to help you? Like, because you didn't help me. You lied to me. And you're playing the white innocence game like you don't know shit. You did know. And you didn't tell me. But I ain't mad with you. I got paid. Okay? And I got the data. And I got solidarity from, from people who told me what you all knew and didn't tell me. I'm not giving you the details because it's a sort of complicated story. This is the academic race, you know. Like we're judge, you know how we go for tenure? A jury of our peers. Except that most of my peers don't know jack about race, don't know the journals, don't know the world. And then they are the ones who judge us. And they routinely like deny us tenure because we're not qualified, yeah? And I now tell them, let's do a thought experiment. Imagine that you went up for tenure and you have a jury of your peers, all of them black and brown. Like, oh, that, that would, would, would never happen. Of course I know it would not happen because you are in a college, you are in an HWCU where there are like three people of color. But imagine, play with me, do an Albert Einstein. Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine that you had 12 people of color judging you. Well, if they are qualified, that's a good comment. How do I know that the white people who judge me are qualified to judge me? When I personally know that they don't know anything about my work, don't value my work, don't read the work, don't know the journals, etc. But they, of course, award themselves objectivity for eternity and condemn me to subjectivity. I, I'm subjective. I am biased. They are unbiased. They are objective. Come on, folks. Objectivity and subjectivity is a two-way street. I'm subjective and objective. So are you. You are subjective and you are objective. You are both, yeah? So anyway, so, <laughs> wow, I apologize. A lot of emotion. Came out because I'm writing now on race and emotion. That's my next book. The title is Feeling Race. Check it out. It will serve for 29 minutes. <laughs> Maybe we have time for one more question if someone has it. If not, we call it a night. Someone make it time. Ask the big question. Yeah? Here? Oh, go ahead. Beneficial for when people should relearn their roots instead of saying, I'm white, I'm German. 
German or I'm this, right? Because like I identify as Chicana, right? So is that a viable solution or what more? Is there something deeper that we need to do? Yes, there's something deeper that we need to do. So it, it is good to begin thinking about, so when we think about race, we think minority people. Race is all of us, yeah? That's why I talk about white, 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 white. Because white people are white. Have you noticed that white people are white? Yeah. But they want to be just human beings. I'm, like, I'm just Bob. Don't call me white Bob. I'm just Bob. But you are black Puerto Rican Eduardo, yeah? <laughs> so we're racialized subjects, yeah? So it's important for us to understand the historical process of the creation and construction of whiteness and white people. Yeah? There is a book by Neil uh, Painter, The History of White People, yeah? Long book, long book. 300 pages longer than it should have been. But she sold it, and someone bought it, including me, two copies. Okay. <laughs> um, but at least after the white category was constructed and reconstructed, it's never finished, yeah, because whiteness keeps changing. Yeah? Today, in the white team, people who were not white 50 years ago are slowly but surely becoming sort of members of the white team. So some Latinos, some Asian Americans may morph into members of the white team. And other groups may sort of move and shift. That's part of the history of race making. It's always a continuous process. Yeah? You need to expand, contract, depending on conditions, needs, politics, etc. But at this juncture, it's not just a matter of recognition of the historicity of the white category. It's also recognizing that to undo the category, we have to undo the system that supports the category. Actually, the system that structures the categories of race, the race, yeah? That is the engine of race making. So we have to kill that monster, and then the race groups ultimately, I think, let me think as an, a utopian person, yeah? Imagine that we remove racism from the wealth system, and we fight to remove the legacy of the racist culture that we have produced out there. Then we, the people we call black, white, et cetera, et cetera, we become just either just human beings or we become sort of member of ethnic, culturally based groups. But if race is not a penalty, then ethnicity should become benign. So I'm Puerto, I will die eating arroz. Any Puerto Rican here? Not a single one? OK, so let me represent my people. We love rice and beans. Arroz con habichuela, and we like this thing called mofongo, which is mashed plantains. If you never eat the mofongo, you haven't eaten shit. <laughs> mofongo is a real, real mofongo. You need to try it. Go to Puerto Rico. Good beer, mofongo, with lobster, with carne frita. But anyway, I'm getting very Puerto Rican at the end of my job. So anyway. So what we need to then think is to remove the system that organizes and gives substance to these racial categories, and then slowly but surely these categories probably will disappear completely or become benign ethnicity. I'm okay with benign ethnicity. I'm better if race eventually disappears from the earth. But I'm going to be pessimistic about what will happen if we remove race from the world? We humans, have, we're very prolific in finding ways of separating ourselves, yeah? So if we remove race from the historical record, we can develop a new category. Let's call it boo. And then boo will become the next <laughs> division of humanity, yeah? So we create these categories, we invent them, and then the categories become real in their consequences. So that's what I think might happen. But, but that is down the road. Our historical job is to fight the monster we have ahead of us and let the future bring whatever the future will bring. Your job at this moment is fight the racial monster of today to try to improve your life and life of your kids and grandkids. When your grandkids are there, then whatever they need to deal, that will be their struggle. Okay, I'm getting tired. Thank you for listening. Fight the power.